Hello and welcome to our first workshop, an introduction to sensory processing. This workshop has been created by the Occupational Therapists at Midlands Partnership NHS Foundation Trust for parents and carers who have children within our autism and child and adolescent mental health teams. It's likely that you're listening to this because you have noticed that some of your child's behaviours and their emotional responses might be linked to sensory processing differences. Firstly, we will introduce the senses and then explain how they work together to help us play, learn, move and respond appropriately to the environment. Finally, we will talk about the three different types of sensory processing difficulties and how these might affect your child. Our next workshops will go into detail about strategies that you can use and ways to adapt the environment to support and help your child function at home, with their friends and at their school. We also have written handouts available on the website that you can download too. Every child is unique in the way they respond to sensation. We want childhood to be a time when children in our care are able to play, learn and grow through meaningful, fun and purposeful activities in their daily lives. Sensory integration, our senses working together, gives us a picture of our world and our place within it. Most of the time, sensory processing happens automatically and we are able to unconsciously organise all the sensations we experience. We respond to the ones we need to help us function and to keep us safe and we are able to ignore the ones we don't need so that we aren't overwhelmed by our physical and our social worlds. A sensory pathway is the journey that starts from when a sensation is noticed in the skin through movement or when we taste or smell something, when we hear, we see and when we feel sensation from within our bodies. The sensation is received by our skin, nose, mouth, eyes, ears and receptors in our joints in our balance organs and internally and the message then travels up the spine or directly into the brain and here it is understood and integrated with other senses and our body and emotions respond accordingly. A baby begins to develop these pathways soon after being conceived. Babies are able to hear, taste, feel and move inside their mother's womb. Sensory development occurs and changes throughout our whole lifespan as we explore and learn from our physical and emotional worlds. Sometimes these sensory pathways, for a number of different reasons, have developed differently and a child might behave or react in a way that's not expected, that might not be helpful or that causes some difficulty functioning in their daily lives. There are the five senses here that we're all familiar with and presumably need no further explanation, but there are also three other very important senses which I shall describe now in a bit more detail. proprioception and vestibular. Proprioception enables our body to move and position itself where and how we want it to. It controls the force and pressure that we use. For example, if we wanted to kick a football, it would control the speed, position, direction and force that we need to get the ball into the air and into the direction that we want it to go. Proprioception works very closely with our vestibular sense. This tells our brain about our balance. It lets us know where we are in space and how fast we are moving. This sense enables us to manage very simple movements, like walking across a room or sitting still on a chair. It also enables us to learn more complex processes, like riding a bike. Our eighth sense is interoception, and this is our sense of what is happening inside our body, such as feeling hunger or that you need to go to the toilet, butterflies in our tummy, itching or a racing heart. Studies have shown that children with autism may have a low awareness of their internal signals. But some children also may have higher levels of awareness, feeling hunger and pain and itching or needing the toilet far more acutely than others do. Sensory integration is the way we receive and organise sensation from the environment around us. The sensation travels via our peripheral nervous system into various parts of the brain where it is understood and organised and here it allows our body to make an effective and meaningful response. All the senses work together, so we form a picture of who we are, where we are, and what is happening around us. The brain also chooses what sensation to ignore. For example, we can usually ignore background noises like traffic or a ticking clock, and we wear our clothes all day without being too aware of them. But we know that for some children and adults, they are very sensitive to sensation and unable to switch it off. They might not cope with the noise of a humming fridge or a label in their shirt. Some children may experience the opposite and not notice when their face is mucky or that they are standing on something sharp. 
Being under and over responsive is suggestive of sensory integration processing difficulties and we will discuss this in more detail in a short while. All the senses work together to enable us to do our daily living activities, to be able to dress, to wash, to eat, to play, to exercise, move, socialise, concentrate and listen. Everything we need to do. Our senses help us adapt and respond to the demands of the world around us and very importantly they keep us safe from danger. Here is an example of how we receive sensory input and make a decision about how to respond. The character in the picture feels a tickle on his hand. The tickle feeling is picked up by receptors under the skin and this information travels up the brain via the sensory pathway. His vision allows him to see the spider on his skin and his brain asks, what does this mean? Is it dangerous to me and have I had this experience before? The message also travels through the fight or flight part of his brain and he might scream and run away because his brain believes it to be dangerous. At this point, his memory, past experience and knowledge work together to help him make the decision and he might decide that it's safe to brush the spider off and get back to whatever he was doing before. There are a number of things in human experience that impact on the development of sensory integration. A few examples include experience of trauma in early life, poor attachment with parents or caregivers, neurodevelopmental conditions such as autism and ADHD and learning disabilities. Later in life, mental health conditions, brain injury, stroke and dementia can also disrupt the sensory pathways. Sensory integration was first developed by Dr. Jean Ayres, an American occupational therapist, in the 1970s. Since then, the neuroscience and research into the therapeutic interventions and understanding has grown significantly and evidence continues to be developed and published today. In the UK, sensory processing is not recognised as a formal diagnosis, but there are three identified categories of sensory processing difficulties. A child may display behaviours that fit into one or all three of these categories. The first one we will talk about are sensory modulation difficulties. Number two is sensory discrimination. And thirdly, we will talk about sensory based motor disorder. Sensory modulation is the ability we have to regulate responses to sensory input in a graded and appropriate way. We can be under or over responsive to different sensory input. In children with modulation problems, you may see poor attention and focus, hyperactivity, underactivity, challenging negative emotions, challenging and dysregulated behaviours, and difficulty engaging in everyday activities. Overresponsivity is sometimes referred to as sensory sensitivity or overreactivity. For consistency today, we will use the term overresponsivity. This occurs when the body perceives that there's too much sensory input. The brain mistakes these sensations as negative and unmanageable and it can cause a fight or flight response or an exaggerated emotional response. Overresponsivity is when the sensory receptors send too much information to the brain. A child might get too much scratchiness from their socks and shoes. The hairdryer might be too loud, washing their face too splashy, brother standing too close to them is very annoying, the sun is too bright in the car and the bolognese you've made is too smelly. They might not cope with sudden loud noises like an ambulance passing, the vacuum cleaner going or the toilet flushing. Sometimes over-responsivity is harder to detect. A child may struggle with the sensory overload of a school setting, but be unable to pinpoint the one aspect of the day that they find difficult to cope with. A child who is over-responsive to sensation will behave in a way that enables them to avoid or escape the sensory input in an attempt to calm and organise themselves. You might see the child become distressed screaming, shouting and becoming angry. The response might be more subtle and they might become fidgety or shut down like they've switched off. They might become overactive to try and regulate themselves through proprioceptive and vestibular input. So you might see them start jumping, spinning, climbing, hitting things, running away and touching everything. They will struggle to focus and concentrate and might not be able to describe to you how they feel. They will find it hard to regulate themselves and look to you as their carer to find the answers. They might not do this in a verbal way. Their behaviours are their communication to you, that they can't cope. A child can also be under-responsive to sensation. Here, the body and brain isn't as effective at processing sensory information and therefore it requires larger amounts of sensory input to recognise it is there. The child may use seeking behaviours to get enough sensory input 
to increase their arousal, attention, postural tone, registration, focus and pleasure. A child with under-responsivity may appear to be quiet and switched off, as they respond passively and don't seek extra input. They might be unaware of what's happening around them in their environment. Alternatively, an active sensory seeking child will get the input they require through increasing their behaviours, needing more and stronger levels of sensation. A child needs just the right amount of sensation that's enough to maintain their concentration and attention span. To be able to choose and maintain a posture when sitting on the floor, or for example to choose the right amount of force and speed to kick a ball or open a door. The brain needs the right amount of information to detect taste and texture of dinner and to know when you've had enough to eat and tummy is full. To be able to hear whether the teacher is asking them a direct question in class, know what clothes to wear for the weather and to move their hand away when something is hot or to know that danger is approaching. A child who is under responsive to tactile input for example may display seeking behaviours such as touching and feeling objects and people more than you would usually expect them to do, perhaps beyond what is felt to be appropriate and they might annoy family members or friends with doing this. A child who is under responsive to taste and smell may prefer food with strong flavours and spices and then add lots of extra flavour or texture to their food. You may notice children turning the sound up high on the TV or looking closely at objects making them move or spin about for extra stimulation. A child who is under responsive to vestibular and proprioceptive input may spin, roll, climb and push things. You might notice here a similarity in behaviours to an over-responsive child. And as therapists and parents, we adopt the role of sensory detective and piece together an understanding of their behaviours to work out our child's sensory profile. You might see changes in your child's sensory responses when your child's anxiety is especially high. And often this means heightened sensitivity. And it happens around times of change and transition for example in the lead up to Christmas, or when holidays start or end. A child may also develop additional sensory seeking behaviours to get additional proprioceptive and tactile deep pressure input. The brain is trying to calm and regulate itself, but the behaviours might seem negative and destructive, such as head banging, biting, pushing things and possibly self-harm. In the following workshops, we will go into more detail about over and under responsivity in relation to each sense area and consider the behaviours that you might see at home and within school with your own child. Sensory discrimination is the ability that we have to interpret sensory information as it comes into our bodies. It enables us to recognise what something is from the way that it smells or sounds, how it feels, what it tastes like, and also to know where our body is in space. We are then able to disregard any irrelevant sensation that we don't need. For example, background noise when someone's talking to us, see something we're looking for straight away in a cluttered drawer, and then to be able to put our hand into a bag without looking and bring out the item we wanted. Sensory discrimination difficulties occur when a child has difficulty interpreting and identifying sensory input. They might find it difficult to tell between hot and cold. They might find it difficult to know how hard to hold something or how soft to stroke a pet and they might find it difficult to detect differing smells, textures and flavours. It could cause them confusion and distress in everyday activities at home and school and cause them to give up easily because the task seems too hard for them to do. Sensory motor processing difficulties include somatodyspraxia, vestibular and bilateral integration and visiodyspraxia. These impact on fine and gross motor movements. A child may have difficulties maintaining appropriate posture planning movement and sequencing tasks. A child with sensory motor processes and difficulties may break their toys by accident more often, struggle to learn and play sports, take longer to learn to ride a bike, have difficulty using a knife and fork together, and dressing themselves. So using buttons or learning to tie shoelaces may take longer than their peers. These difficulties are usually assessed by a paediatric occupational therapist and we won't be covering this in these workshops. If you feel that these difficulties are experienced by your child and impact on their everyday quality of life, please speak to your key worker from the team that you're under and they can discuss further whether a referral to a paedi paediatric OT might be needed. Finally, for this workshop, I will talk through why we use sensory strategies to help children function in their everyday lives. Our brain, through our senses, needs a balanced input of sensation in order for us to be able to make sense of and function in the world that we live. We need to experience a variety of sensations each and every day in order to keep our brain energised, organised, alert or calm. 
A sensory activities routine is something we might recommend to you and the child in your care to help regulate themselves to be in the just right state for the task they want or need to do. We will go into these sensory strategies in our next workshop, but here are the key points. Activity must be child-led and play-based where possible. Use deep pressure touch and proprioceptive input for increasing under-responsive sensory seeking behaviours and also to calm over-responsivity. Adapt the environment to support your child's need for sensory input as much as possible, either by removing and reducing things that contribute to stress and sensory overload or to add stimulation for children who need extra input. It can really help your child if you adapt these behaviours together and to co-regulate. There are multiple benefits of co-regulation, including normalising the activity for them, strengthening your relationship and bond, and by calming and regulating your own arousal levels. Thank you for listening to our workshop. We hope you have found it informative and have time to listen to further sessions in which we shall go into more detail about sensory strategies to support your child at home and in school.